Welcome this morning to Bethel Bible Fellowship. It's great to see you here this morning. I'm glad that you're all here. Um, If you're a visitor, we welcome you uh, to join us in worshiping God as we worship him through singing songs of praise as we have just begun by hearing and and listening to the word of God taught. That's part of our worship of him. We're going to worship him by giving financially, by remembering the Lord and breaking of bread, by praying together and by fellowshipping with one another. All these things are part of our corporate worship and we welcome you to join us as we call upon the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful to you this morning that we're here, that we're in this place, and that we have before us your word, your unchanging word. We thank you that you wrote a book, that you collated it, that you preserved it for us, and now we have it in our hands. We even have it on our cell phones. We have it abundantly available to us, and we're grateful that we have it. We ask now that you would grant us understanding of it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me begin by saying that human beings are inherently religious. The image of God in man, though it's been marred, it's been broken by the fall, still compels people everywhere to worship. As a result, there have been and there are today innumerable religious uh, philosophies, religions, and worldviews. And they range from animistic religions all the way to sophisticated religious systems. But those religious systems, though they differ widely from one another with respect to their details, fall into two categories. On the one hand, there's the religion of human achievement. And on the other hand, there's the religion of divine accomplishment. In every religion, other than biblical Christianity, man achieves salvation or some afterlife benefit by his own works, by his own efforts. For example, Buddhists seek nirvana by following the eightfold path, human achievement. Muslims hope to be saved and enter paradise by living out the five pillars of Islam, human achievement. Mormons seek godhood through baptism, church membership, accepting Joseph Smith and his successors as prophets, and going through temple ceremonies, human achievement. Jehovah's Witnesses seek to earn eternal life here on this earth by living morally and doing door-to-door proselytizing, human achievement. Roman Catholics seek salvation by means of, the means of grace, by the mass, by sacraments, by prayers, by good works that cooperate with grace to enable them to reach heaven. And they will need some help from a few friends, their family and friends, so that they can escape purgatory. Human achievement. You see, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Sadly, the human achievement efforts of all the world's religions serve only to damn the eternal souls of those who vainly trust in them. On the other hand, there is only one way to receive a right standing before God, and that is the religion of divine accomplishment, belief in the saving gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the gospel, the good news of the grace of God, according to Romans 1.16, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Salvation is entirely by grace, God's undeserved favor. Ephesians 2 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. That's divine accomplishment. Not as the result of works. Human achievement. 
so that no one may boast. Now, by the time of Christ, the religion of Israel had degenerated into a system of works-based righteousness or external ritual instead of internal reality. And Paul explains this final condition of the Jews of Jesus' day in Romans chapter 9, saying Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. but as though it were by works. They didn't do it by faith in God's divine accomplishment. They pursued it through works, human achievement. The Jews of Jesus' day had become secure in their self-righteousness, and they refused to acknowledge that they were spiritually impoverished, imprisoned, blind, and oppressed. And it's against this backdrop of self-righteousness based on outward conformity to God's law that our passage for today is set. So let's read it. Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 27. And after that, he, Jesus, went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind him, got up and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples saying, Why do you eat with and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, It's not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, the disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same. But yours, eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, you cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom fast when the bridegroom is with them, can you? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and they will fast in those days. And he was also telling them a parable. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled out, and the skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put in fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wishes for the new. For he says, the old is good enough. May God bless to us the reading of his word. In verse 27, we read about the call of Levi, who after his conversion became known as Matthew. After he went out, Jesus, after he went out, after that, after um, forgiving the sins of and healing the paralytic, after that scene, he went out, Jesus went out, and noticed a tax collector sitting, named Levi sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. Now, according to Mark, Jesus is um, on the shore near Capernaum, and he's on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And there he saw a tax collector sitting in his booth. And before we look at what happened here, it would be good for us to understand a bit about taxes and tax collectors in Jesus' day. The Romans taxed Israel because Israel was a vassal state to Rome. Rome had captured Israel militarily, and now they had to pay taxes to Rome. The collected taxes would go to the Roman governor, who would then forward them to Rome. Tax franchises were sold to the highest bidder, and they were very lucrative. The collectors had an amount that they were required to collect, and whatever they collected beyond that, they could keep. And there were taxes on everything. 
a poll tax was levied on every adult, regardless of their social status, slave, free, male, female, every adult, a poll tax. Then there was an income tax, 1%. Then there was a land tax. That was 10% of all grain and 20% of all grapes and wine. In addition to those general taxes, there were specific taxes for the transportation of all goods. The commercial transportation of goods were taxed. There were taxes on letters, taxes on roads, taxes on bridges. And associated with the collection of all those taxes, there was theft, extortion, exploitation, and loan sharking, along with the thugs needed to threaten and beat up the people who would not pay. A real racket. The tax collectors were considered to be traitors. They were Jews who worked for the Romans. They were traitors. They were classified as unclean. And they were barred from the synagogues. They were forbidden to give testimony in court because they were notorious liars. As a group, they were just thought of as liars and they couldn't give testimony in court. Repentance was deemed especially difficult for a tax collector. Like lepers who were physically unclean, tax collectors were morally unclean. Alfred Edersheim, in his book, The Life and Times of the Messiah, listed two kinds of tax collectors. First, there were the gabai. These collected the general taxes, the poll tax, the income tax, the land tax. Second, there were makes, who collected the more specific transportation, road, bridge, letters, the tax on those things. And there were a big or great makes, and there were little makes. The great makes did not personally collect taxes, but he hired the little makes to sit in the tax booths and gather taxes. And because they were in contact with the people, the little makes were the most reviled and despised tax collectors. Your King James Version calls them publicans. They were tax collectors. And since Jesus found Levi sitting in the tax booth, he would have been a little Machais, one of the most hated men in Capernaum. And he was, according to Mark, by the seashore, which would indicate that he collected taxes from the fishermen, which is one of the main industries of Capernaum. And that would have made him even more despised than the average little Machais. And Jesus noticed Levi and said to him, follow me. Previously, Jesus had touched a leper and healed him. Then he had forgiven the sins of a paralyzed man and healed him. Now, here, Jesus took the initiative in a relationship with a hated outcast, Levi, the despised tax collector. Do you notice a pattern? Jesus went to the sinners, to the down and out, the outcasts. More specifically, he went to the people who knew that they were needy, that they were poor and wretched and blind and naked morally, that they were broken. And let me just note that just as rough-cut fishermen, lepers, paralytics, and tax collectors can follow the Lord, so can we. We qualify. Anyone who responds to Jesus can become his followers. He will receive sinners. He will receive people from the wrong side of the tracks. He will receive you. Anyone who hears his call, follow me, can come.
Verse 28. And he left everything behind. Got up and began to follow him. That Levi left everything behind implies an irreversible action. Just as Peter, James, and John forsook all and left everything behind, so Levi left everything behind and followed Jesus. He made a decisive choice to leave his old friends, his old life, to break with his past, to begin a new continual pattern of following Christ. Levi, the traitor, the robber, the outcast, Levi, the unclean sinner, became a disciple. And later, he became an apostle. And then he wrote the gospel that we have, first book in the New Testament, Matthew. The evangelized became an evangelist for Jesus Christ. He traded an immoral, temporary career for a holy, eternal destiny. He gave up material possessions, but he gained an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and reserved in heaven. He lost sinful companions, but he gained the fellowship, friendship, and companionship of the Son of God. Verse 29. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. There was a great crowd of the scum of the earth, tax collectors and other people, reclining at the table with them. Levi's first action as a follower of Jesus was to throw a large reception, a big party, a great banquet for Jesus in his house. And the fact that his house was big enough to handle a great party and a great banquet indicates that it was a large house, which also indicates he was very wealthy. And now, all that money, all those resources were turned over to reveal his new relationship with Jesus Christ. He pointed his friends to a new kind of religious leader, one who seeks out those who are lost and separated from God and who know it. Well, this party didn't sit well with the religious elite the Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at the disciples, saying, why do you eat with the tax collectors and sinners? You see, interacting with outcasts, like the people assembled at Levi's house, on any level, even talking to them was bad enough. But eating and drinking with them implied a level of friendship that was abhorrent to the Pharisees. Now, Look at the contrast. Jesus is befriending sinners, the worst kind of sinners, people who knew they were sinners in order to win them to himself. But the religious elite were scandalized. They objected to the things that those people do. Oh my, if you saw the things that those people do. So they refused to even talk about them. Talk to them. Now I want you to consider this question. Who do you, who do I, want to imitate? Jesus or the Pharisees? Do you know any sinners? Do you know any thieves, liars, immoral people? Are you willing to befriend them, eat with them, be seen in genuine fellowship with them in order to win a hearing for the gospel? Or does that offend your sensibilities (laughs) so that you refuse to interact with them, to be kind to them, to be winsome, Toward them. Again, I ask myself and I ask you, do you want to be like Jesus or like the Pharisees? The Pharisees and the scribes raised the objection, the question, why do you eat 
and drink with the tax collectors and sinners. So Jesus answered them. It's not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call, not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus' purpose for meeting with, for befriending and fellowshipping with the tax collectors and sinners is made clear in this verse. I have come to call sinners to repentance. Here's Jesus' mission statement. He came to this earth to save sinners. People who know they are sinners. Like the tax collector and his friends. He did not come to save people who are self-righteous. Like the Pharisees and the scribes. When a person like Levi, who knows he is a sinner, comes to the Lord in humble repentance, the Lord will save him. Divine accomplishment. Levi doesn't do anything. God does it all. God does the work. It's by grace. And in this context, the word grace means undeserved favor. It's not deserved. It's not earned. That's by nature, not something that responds to human achievement. It's not earned. It's freely given. But when a person, like the Pharisees and the scribes, try to come to God in their self-righteousness, the Lord can't save him or her because they seek to be saved by their own efforts, by their own human achievement. Jesus came to call sinners to repentance. So Jesus met with and fellowshiped with Levi's sinful friends out of compassion, mercy, and love for them, out of concern for their souls. He wanted them to hear the gospel and to be saved. These people were sick, and Jesus was the physician They were sinners and he was the savior. So in love for them, he went to them and befriended them and called them to repentance. So it bears repeating. Do you want to be like Jesus or like the Pharisees? Well, Jesus has given his answer, hasn't he? He's not looking for people who think they are righteous. Mm -mm. Who can earn their way into heaven by human achievement. He came for the people who know they are sinners. Who will be completely reliant upon God to save them, on the physician to heal them. In short, divine accomplishment. But the Pharisees and scribes were not finished with Jesus yet. So they ask him another question in verse 33. They said to him, the disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink. Fasting was one of three major activities that the Jews did to demonstrate their religious piety. The other two were prayer So there's fasting, prayer, and giving alms. Giving alms is giving money so that it could be distributed to the poor. Those three things. And they were all done publicly and ostentatiously in order to demonstrate the righteousness of the person who's doing the thing. Human achievement. You see that? Jesus had previously discussed these things in his Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 6, here's what he said about giving alms. So, when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they had their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And then about praying. When you pray, you are to not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corner so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. 
But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So giving alms and praying were to be done secretly, just between you and God. But that's not what the Pharisees and the scribes did. They gave publicly so that they could be seen by men. Then in verses 16 to 18, Jesus taught about fasting. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The Pharisees, while Leviticus only required one fast at one of the great feasts, the Pharisees fasted every Monday and Thursday. How they landed on those days, I couldn't tell you, but they fasted every Monday and Thursday according to the historians of the day. But Jesus' disciples ignored those ritualistic fasts, and they ate and drank. And the problem here from the viewpoint of the Pharisees was that the disciples of Jesus did not exhibit the trappings of Jewish piety, the expressions of human achievement that the Pharisees and their people did. So the Pharisees, scribes, and some disciples of John demanded an explanation for their egregious breach of Jewish custom and their failure to show their devotion and piety. And Jesus said to them, you cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom fast when the bridegroom is with them, can you? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and they will fast in those days. Just as it's inappropriate for the attending, the attending, the attendance at a wedding to fast when the bridegroom is present, because a wedding is a time for feasting, not fasting, so it would be inappropriate for Jesus' followers to fast and mourn while he was present with them. But Jesus, Jesus went on to explain the bridegroom, he would not always be present with them. Jesus would soon be taken away. And they would be left alone, wouldn't they? He was arrested, falsely tried, and crucified. He would be taken away. Then his people would fast. And according to Acts, verses chapter 14 and chapter 13, the New Testament church did fast. But not now. Not while the bridegroom was present. Not while Jesus was there. They could not and would not fast now. They would fast when it became appropriate to fast. The Jews wanted Jesus and his disciples to conform to their version of religion, the religion of human achievement, the religion of external compliance and show of piety. But Jesus was bringing something new, something completely different, from the current version of rabbinic Judaism. And he explained this using three parables. And he's, he was also telling them a parable. These three parables, each one starts with the phrase, no one. Three, three parables. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts on it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will both tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. The first parable highlighted the incompatibility of a piece of cloth that is cut from a new garment with an old garment. You can't take the piece from the new unwashed garment and sew it into an old garment. When you cut the piece out of the new garment, you ruin it. That'll destroy the new garment. And then when you patch the unshrunk cloth onto the old garment and wash it, then it'll shrink and it'll tear away from the old garment cloth and the old garment will be ruined. So you end up with two ruined garments. Jesus' point was that the gospel of the kingdom of God that he was preaching, the gospel of salvation by grace through faith, 
the religion of divine accomplishment was not compatible with the current version of Judaism that was being advocated by the scribes and Pharisees, the religion of human achievement. They were not compatible. The second parable was about wine and wineskins. No one, this is how the parable is introduced, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled out and the skins will be ruined. But the new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. Well, you know this. Animal skins were, that were properly cured and cleaned and scraped were used for fermentation of wine because of their elasticity. When they were new, they were stretchy. As the wine fermented, pressure would build up, stretching the wineskins. A previously stretched skin lacked elasticity, and it would rupture, ruining both the wine by spilling it out on the ground and the wineskin. And Jesus used this illustration to teach that the old The forms of old rituals, such as ceremonial fasting practiced by the Pharisees and John's disciples, were not fit to hold the new wine of the new covenant era. The new wine of Jesus' gospel that would not fit into old rituals and traditions. What Jesus was saying with both the cloth and the garment and the wine and the wineskin illustrations was that what the Pharisees did in their ritual and public fasting or in any other ritual or tradition had no part to do with his new gospel. And then Jesus gave a third parable that, sadly enough, is also true. And no one after drinking the old wine, wishes for new. For he says, hmm, that old stuff is good. If a person drinks the old wine of ritualistic rabbinic Judaism, if a person drinks the wine of human achievement, thinking that their works will be compared with other people's works, and if theirs are better, then they'll be well-received in heaven, human achievement. When a person gets a taste of the wine of human achievement, he's not very interested in the wine of divine accomplishment. By the way, it's important to note that what Jesus is calling the old garment, the old wineskins, and the old wine in these three parables He's not talking about the true teachings of the Old Testament. He's talking about their corrupted version of rabbinic Judaism of the day. Their system of works-based righteousness. He's not talking about what happened with those Old Testament saints who were saved by faith. He's He's not comparing that. He's talking about their version Jesus didn't come to patch the old system. The old system that relied on human achievement. He came to replace it with a new gospel. Good news of salvation. Salvation of grace through faith. Jesus taught the new wine of the gospel of the kingdom of God compared to the old wineskins of external obedience. He taught a gospel of divine accomplishment instead of their gospel of human achievement. He preached truth, resulting in internal change and heart righteousness, compared to the facade of external compliance and self-reliance that they taught. The old garment and the old wineskins and the old wine of corrupted Judaism that the scribes and Pharisees taught, exemplified in fasting by show, for show, 
could not be combined with the new cloth and the new wine of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The new gospel calls sinners to repentance and to rely on the grace of God, the accomplishments of God. The old called adherence to external conformity to rely on achievements of men and the work of the flesh. Where, where are you at today? Are you relying upon the grace of God, the undeserved favor of God, the shed blood of Jesus Christ to pay for your sins, something you did not and could not earn? Are you relying on God's grace? Or do you find yourself saying, I, I've just got to do better Oh, actually, I have done better than them. I'm okay. I'm good. Where do you lie? In conclusion, let me say that this gospel of grace cannot be patched into any works-based religious system. Can't be which, as I have said before, includes not only the ritualistic Judaism of Jesus' day, but every other religion around the world throughout the ages that has been designed by man. Have you been included in Jesus' mission statement? I have come to call sinners to repentance. Do you understand that on your own, you are a sinner? Have you come to him in repentance? If you do, you will be included. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you would take your word and you would apply it to our hearts that we would hear your truth, that it would resonate with our, within us, that we would use it to examine ourselves and our, and our motives and why we're doing what we're doing here in this church and collecting together as a, as a community of believers. We ask that you would use your word to try us and to test us. And, and we ask, too, that you would use your word to encourage us and build us up to become more and more amazed at the grace that you have exhibited by saving us. What a motley crew. What a group of ruined, broken sinners with nothing worthwhile to bring to you. But you've saved us. And we bless you. Amen.